Jack and my colleagues, uh, Jack and Michael, who are uh, who have been working with me on this. Uh, well, we've collectively been working on this. It's uh, our proposal or our idea was, can you algorithmically trade sports betting? Um, so hey, uh, Jack, Jack, before you go further, mm -hmm. maybe you could give some uh, credit to. Uh... Oh, yeah. And we've, we've been Please. conducting this research under uh, Ben's supervision. Obviously, you heard from earlier about uh, ML. This is a little, little bit different, but uh, definitely, definitely uh, interesting in, in its own way. So, um, yeah. So anyway, a little bit about us. Uh, I'm Jack. I'm a second year MFE student. Uh, my undergrad is in finance from Lehigh, and uh, I'm also working part time at Millennium uh, in fixed income right now. And uh, Jack and... Yeah, uh, I'm Jack Gill. I uh, also am a, a second year MFE student with a BS in finance. Um, and uh, my main interests are data science, financial technology, and uh, quantitative research in emerging markets. Yeah, and I'm Michael. I'm also a second year MFE student. Uh, my background is a BA in mathematics from UVM. So with that, yeah, so the idea of this project stems from the hypothesis that there are potential investment opportunities in the quickly emerging legal sports betting market in the United States. Um, to test this, we looked at three core questions. One, can trades be hedged to minimize risk? Two, is their data accessible to validate and test strategies? And three, does an alpha exist despite it being a negative sum game? Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the sports betting market, uh, Positions are essentially binary futures. You put money on one side of a line and you either win and get the price return or you lose and you get nothing. Um, and so because of this, we can apply derivative concepts to create traded spreads. Um, if we combine different pricings of the same prop from different books, we can yield PL charts that resemble short strangles, long butterflies, box spreads, et cetera. And uh, this led us to focus on two specific strategies uh, that are termed middling and juicing. Um, that I'll go more in depth about in the next couple slides. Um, but the, the core idea here is these strategies answer the first question posed of, can we minimize risk? To which the answer is yes. Um, so the first, the first strategy we'll look more in depth at is the middling strategy. It's, it's similar to a short straddle or a long butterfly, which are pictured there on the left. Um, in order for this to work, we need separate books to price the same player at a different line. Uh, for example, we have a James Harden prop here um, where one book, DraftKings, has him at over under 29 and a half points, and uh, two other books, FanDuel and PointsBet, have him at over under 32 and a half points. And so the strategy is to take the over of the lower line and the under of the higher line, which essentially creates a, a strangle and leads to a very low risk outcome. If he scores in between 29.5 and 32.5, which we term the window, we win both bets and return nearly 200%. Um, now, if it doesn't land between the two lines, we just lose the premium the book takes off the top, which is usually only around 5%. Um, the other strategy is the juicing strategy. It's much more simpler. Um, the way this works is if different books have the same player prop at the same line, but there are positive odds on both sides. Um, this is just true arbitrage. There will always be a small positive return in these situations because you always win exactly one of those two bets and it returns positive odds. Um, the catch is these opportunities occur much less in the market than the middle of opportunities. Okay, so how, so how are we gonna do all this? Um, first and foremost, we're going to, we're gonna need data. And the, this is kind of the crux of what makes this a little bit of a difficult project as this data is not easily available. Um, <clears throat> the, it's not like the financial markets where you can just, you know, boot up Bloomberg or, or, or linked up to an API and get years of historical stock data. There's, there's really no historicals available. Um, it's not in the book's best interest. So, so it's definitely not easy. Um, and the, the books themselves, their actual websites, they protect their, uh, their information pretty well behind their, their uh, security. So we ended up going with, and if you can go to the next slide, Jack. So we ended up going with um, this, uh, this website called Scores and Odds, which you can see there on the left. Uh, this is, that's kind of, that's what their uh, user interface looks like. And so you see there's a table and there's a drop-down menu and it has the different props. 
which are essentially just the underlying statistics that the that the um, these thing that these bets derive their value from. And on the right, you can see the HTML code that uh, underlies this this table, and it it's basically uh, one giant blob. It, realistically for, for each league. So for the NFL, all of it's there and it's kind of mixed in and it's, it's, it's not super easy to get. So this is, and if you go to the next slide, Jack, it brings us to what this system is overall doing up at the top. You know, this, this is where the, the, it's the HTML code. And we have a number of different modules that, that do different things, both, uh, live for, for the live scraping and pricing and for uh, back test purposes and strategy definition purposes. <clears throat> but uh, basically how this works is we, we uh, run this based off of a, a separate script that is uh, it's basically just a timer and, and, it, and it controls how this works. It's easy to change to, your, to a desired frequency. And we do some kind of some loading in data at certain times so that it it runs efficiently enough to, to get us everything. Um, we store and and price the data. Um, we restore the data first, the cleaned lines data with everything and, and no prices or, or filters down necessarily. And then we go further and and, and we price and, and I'll get into that a little bit further. But first, check go ahead to the next slide. We're I'm going to talk a bit about just real quick about how these odds work because they're a little bit confusing. So you see, typically you, in America and, and on scores and odds, you see American odds, which is where you see things listed at an over of six and a half plus 120 under six and a half minus 140. So what does this mean? The, the basic interpretation is for Negative odds, they're considered to be the underdog and thus the, the payout is not as good and for positive odds better. Um, you, if it's positive, you expect to get, in this case, $120 for each 100 that you would put down. And for the negative case, you would need to risk $140 to win 100. So that's a little bit weird. And to make it both more intuitive and calculations generally easier for us, we end up converting to uh, decimal odds, which I, I show in the, at the bottom there, a little example of how that works. Um, but it's, it's very useful because this functionally is then a payout multiplier. Uh, so if you bet that $100 and you're going to get uh, the uh, 220 there. And you can also divide these. Um, if, you, if you do one over the, the decimal odds this, and add them together, this is what is considered to be the implied probability of the book. And the book is doing their job right. It's going to be greater than one, which is a little weird, but we'll about that in a second. Go to the next slide, Jack. Okay, great. So this is a, an example of a few uh, typical spreads. They're, they're nothing particularly impressive, but here you can see that they have their, <coughs> the line is going to be set at minus 124 and minus 110. And so there's a spread of one. And what, what we do is we go in and, and we have a um, a model that, that is going to query the specific players that we're looking at, and it's going to query their historical data. It's going to fit distributions to them, and it's going to try it out based on uh, different criterion, namely uh, some squared errors, a, the uh, AIC and, and BIC criterion. And if uh, the model tells us to do it, we calculate it for that, and, and we kind of use this to tweak some risk later on. <clears throat> You go to the next one. Yeah, there we go. And so this is an example of two, two really good spreads here. If you, you can look down at the bottom that all the EVs are greater than one. Um, this is because we split the, we hedge the odds here between a dollar. You can see the, the weights on the under and the weights on the over would sum to one. Thus, if we, if we bet one dollar, this, our, our model here is telling us that on, on the low end, we expect to, you know, our expected value is, is, is still handily over, over that $1 mark, which is, which is what you want to see. And this makes sense because you can see that not only is there a spread, uh, a, an arbitrage opportunity, so to speak, but there is also uh, positive odds on both sides of the line. So it's, it's, you know, it's free money here, which is, which is pretty cool. So next part here. 
like so an important question to ask is how is this happening you know we know that it's a negative sum game as jack said earlier we can <clears throat> the probability is always over one this is known as the vig the vigorous it's what bookmakers kind of take off the top um so this is happening primarily because the bookmakers are in also interested in hedging their own risk. If there's too much action on one side of the line, then they are going, they're, they're gonna have far more exposure than they want. And they price these things typically using Monte Carlo simulation, simulations. So while there is a lot of that randomness that comes in and, and you could use that certainly as, as a way to, to analyze this market, it, is, it really only tells half the story, uh, you know, would make volume volume data very helpful here but when there's so much so much on one side the books are going to move a lot and you can see that on the next slide here which is a uh, an interesting couple this is um this is the point spread from yesterday on Giannis onto the uh and you can see that overall the line itself which is what it's set for his for the stats for the points that he's going to have to hit over or under in order for the bet to pay out it's relatively stationary for, for throughout the day up to game time. But you can see here on the, the under odds, there is a, there's a lot of fluctuation here. So herein kind of lies the crux of why, how return is possible and how we can get it from, from this data, but also why it's, it's difficult. So you, one more example on the next slide here shows how even when a line may be completely um, still, and this is uh, rebounds on uh, Kevin Durant, I believe. And even when the line is still in and of itself, there's it, it fluctuates all over the place at the same time on the odds, and that's what determines the price. So, so that's what creates those opportunities. So. We've answered the first two questions to the best that we could of can we hedge a trade well yes we can combo spreads together and does the data exist well yes we just have to have to create a system to go and get it the next question is does does alpha exist so naturally we ran a back test and specifically we back tested data that we pulled on basketball this past season and uh, right now i'm looking at it as three different strategies for middling uh specifically on points rebounds and assists and we calculated what uh, based on the edge, if you will, of each position, right, which is the expected value of the position, that di difference between the money put into the position, and we can filter which positions we want to take based on however much edge there is. And then based on that, we can then also calculate a sharp ratio by assuming that by, if you think about the overlaying, pos the position we're taking as a, uh, almost a Bernoulli trial where there's two binary outcomes, and we price a problem a probability on one of them, or on the one outcome, then we'll have the probability of the other. And we can calculate a variance in each position as well. Combling them together, we can create these sharp ratios. And as we can see, as you require more and more edge, there's more and more potential excess returns here. However, it's important to note that these sharp ratios are extremely close to zero. Um, that was a little bit odd, but if you think about it, that could also make sense because in the sports gambling world, as we said, it's a negative sum game for anyone that's playing. The benchmark return should really be less than zero. Uh, in this case, we're benchmarking it against a, uh, against a return of zero. So if you mess with the numbers a little bit, the sharps become a little bit more attractive. Um, but that could also be because of the just binary nature of the of the market and of the way that we're taking positions there's various things going on here but the other thing to consider which we have on the the next slide is if we take the sharp ratio of the entire basketball portfolio over the season as we can see there's more and more as we require more and more edge there's more and more potential excess return but there's also an important thing to note there's less and less positions to take that happens to fall on exponential decay. So as you can see, like, well, I mentioned on the, I had on the last side that a sharp of uh, an edge requirement of say 0.3, which would be 30 cents on each dollar put in, right? Would generally optimize it. But that turns out to be less than a hundred positions out of the total season. This is a season of 82 games by, uh, by however many teams are in, 
really that's like a position every couple of every five to 10 games or so. It doesn't really from a portfolio, it doesn't really seem like a, the, the best way to go about it. So the edge might be the, the required edge might be even less such that you can take more positions and have a more risk diversified portfolio. Um, so with that, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I know we ran over a little bit. We have, uh, I see that there's a, mm -hmm. a chat, but uh, 